Hello everybody. Today I'm going to talk to you about contemporary finance. Contemporary as in the kind of finance that affects the lives of people on a daily basis. Governments, corporations, individuals and the flow of capital and how it affects economies and lives. Uh, macro and micro. I'm Sampat Iyengar. I'm a general partner in uh, Forum Synergies Private Equity Fund Managers. We manage growth capital and we invest in Indian companies that are looking for significant growth. So typically companies that are over the survival hump and are now looking to grow, globalize, institutionalize. And uh, most often they could either grow and do an IPO or they could grow and get bought out. Our style is that of what we call active fund management. And this is something I'll talk about a little more in detail later. We are active fund managers. We get involved with the companies that we invest in. And uh, being a former CEO, uh, I've run companies in uh, technology, software, outsourcing, and finance for about 20 years on a global basis. We're able to make a significant difference to the companies that we invest in. So let's look at the world from, from the standpoint of capital allocators and managers. So when you think about who are the capital allocators, you're looking at pension funds, endowments and foundations, sovereign wealth funds, countries that set up wealth funds themselves, uh, Singapore, many of the Middle East countries, Japan. There are, this, is, this is a trend that's happened over the last two decades and one of the things that we are trying to see is how Potentially, India could also set up a sovereign wealth fund. Corporate treasuries, family offices, and individuals. So all of these dominate what we call allocation of capital globally. On the other side are what we call managers of capital, or fund managers as they are known. In the fund management world or in the investment banking world, you know people as buy side versus sell side. Brokerages are typically what we call sell side and fund managers and asset managers on the buy side. Now, as you, as you all probably know, mutual funds came first. They came early uh, in the life cycle of fund management and hence they're considered mainstream. Later, when private equity, venture capital and hedge funds came in, they came in as an alternative to mutual funds and hence they're known as alternative uh, investments in the, in, the, in the world of finance. The sort of asset classes instruments you see are uh, in equity, debt, derivatives, we have structured instruments. Uh, classes, uh, asset classes include currency, commodities, gold, sovereign bonds, corporate debt, even real estate uh, is an asset class and is now available uh, publicly and in a more liquid form uh, as real estate investment trusts or REITs as they are known. Now, there are private and public markets for asset classes. So oftentimes, uh, uh, you know, we see many uh, commodities like gold, for instance, which never were available in a public liquid form, now available in a derivative form as well. It's a heavily regulated industry and hence it's got a rich ecosystem of service providers. There are people who do your compliance for you. There are people who will uh, who'll, who'll make sure that they set up the right structures for you on site, offshore, Mauritius, Cayman Islands, and uh, there are accountants and there are auditors, uh, there are people who will help funds raise capital, they call cap, uh, capital intro introducers, and investment banks also play that role. Now typically, if you look at capital allocators, what drives capital allocation for them? So, mostly, there are ideas and thesis. So there's a thesis that if, we, that if we invest in a particular sector in the market, that we believe that the risk adjusted return could be very significant in a particular period. That's, a, that's an example of a thesis. So, you know, capital allocators look for ideas and thesis. They look for sophisticated models. They're trying to understand, you know, who's the next smart hedge fund manager who can generate alpha significant to what the markets can generate. 
And many of these models are actually built using, uh, you know, very uh, complex ideas in math, statistics, and even physics when you look at some of the quantitative uh, models that are actually used. So some sophisticated models that try and give a capital allocator an edge either in terms of return or liquidity or risk or, or correlation is another thing that drives capital allocation strategies. They also look for specialized knowledge. Do you have domain knowledge, knowledge of a geography, knowledge of a market, knowledge of an asset class? All of those things become very valuable to allocators. People are looking for cutting edge technology. If you look at high frequency trading, for instance, you know, if, if, if someone wants to deliver uh, a risk adjusted return, which is going to be uh, significant in terms of what other people are able to do in large complex markets, technology provides the edge. Without technology, we will not be able to deliver that alpha. And allocators are always looking for mispricing. So an asset that's mispriced, you know, often value investors will say, you know, the true value of this particular investment is actually below the market price or above the market price. They'll make some calls, basis what they see as an asset being mispriced. And mispricing is a sophisticated art form. When you, when you seek mispricing, you actually look for ways and means uh, to, to determine if there's a behavioral impact to a price or is it a fundamental impact to a price. Risk management, you know, risk is crucial. Uh, you, you know, all allocators are looking at risk adjusted returns. So risk is baked into the equation and the conversation. Uh, allocators are looking for change. You know, the whole world of impact investing is looking to see how they can change the world, change markets, change the firm, improve governance, uh, looking at how companies are going to have a favorable impact on environment or not damage the environment enough depending on the sector they are in. Now obviously, inflation is the beast that capital allocators are trying to slay or destroy. If we didn't have inflation in a static world, you know, the hunger for risk adjusted returns would not be the same as we have in the context of inflation. So let's talk about private equity. Uh, you know, so when I look at uh, the big alternative investments uh, sectors, you know, private equity is a, is a very dominant player globally, perhaps in the five to six trillion dollar range. So what does private equity do? Essentially, private equity buys equity in private businesses. Private equity like to think of themselves as change agents. They like to look at turnaround situations, transformation situations, rapid growth. And they seek to see what are growth levers, what are significant value levers that can be pushed uh, by bringing in some change into an organization through which they can derive significant upside over a period of typically three, five, seven years. That's the kind of private equity horizon. <clears throat> the origins of private equity back in the go-go days in the US, you had these things called LBOs, uh, leveraged buyouts. Debt was really cheap. So what, what would a private equity fund do? Basically take a company, acquire equity, load up on debt, and then make sure that you're able to drive business objectives by leveraging the cheap debt. Returns to investors were always measured on the equity that went in. So the debt was very helpful in delivering risk-adjusted returns on equity without the cost of debt being felt by investors. So uh, the, the era of cheap debt doesn't exist in many countries, especially not in India. And uh, uh, the outsized return on equity that private equity funds had to provide often had to come from more active fund management styles. And fund styles are a big aspect. So a more active fund management style, you could, you could almost be activist sometimes as a fund manager. You could really get deeply involved in a sector and try and improve the structurals of a sector as well. So private equity funds have matured. You, 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 top, you typically see funds that are now growth capital buyouts. Fundamental difference between growth capital and buyouts. Growth capital, a fund would take a significant minority stake. Not to control, it's not a controlling interest. You would take a stake to ensure there was enough uh, position in the firm so you could influence direction, influence key decisions, influence strategy, influence execution 
and so on. Buyouts were typically when a fund believed they needed to take a controlling interest. So anything above 50% would qualify to be a buyout. A fund would come, buy it out. Oftentimes in a buyout, a fund would even replace the management. Because they have a thesis, they have an idea that they want to bring in to a particular entity when they do a buyout. The intent is fundamentally in private equity to invest and improve the business and deliver a significant return to your investors. And the targeted returns are in the range of 20% plus in, uh, in the private equity asset class, 20% IRR. So let's look at venture capital. Venture capital, also known as vulture capital, you know, many people have talked about how uh, venture capital as, a, as an asset class or as a style of investing has actually not helped uh, entrepreneurs and hence the, the moniker of uh, vulture capital. But you know, if you look at it very seriously, venture capital has really driven huge amount of uh, innovation globally. It's a subset of private equity, technically speaking. Uh, it really comes in early stage. It's also known as risk capital because venture capital tends to uh, look for risk adjusted returns where the risk is very high. Survival risk, it's often, you know, when VCs as they are known come in, the survival risk is high and hence they seek super high returns because of the fact that they're taking on survival risk of entities. Traditionally, uh, venture capitalists have come in uh, heavily into uh, emerging sectors what they call sunrise sectors, information technology, communications, and e-commerce, and anything that is potentially disruptive uh, in terms of changing a sector or even changing the world uh, in terms of fundamental technology or application of technology is where you will see VCs get involved because it offers massive scale. And, uh, you know, a venture capitalist has to op often invest uh, in uh, 10 companies to get one successful company. Private equity, on the other hand, tends to make higher conviction bets. But VCs have to, we often joke, spray and pray. But the intent of a venture capitalist is really to nurture, even predict technology. And uh, like I said, the targeted returns are higher, 25% plus IRR, often 30% plus IRR. The successful VCs globally have done even more than that. Then we look at hedge funds. Now, hedge funds have always, you know, been a puzzlement for a lot of people. You know, what are hedge funds? They, they, they hold a certain mystic. We often hear of hedge fund billionaires. Uh, not too many people understand hedge funds. I've spent about five years at the front row seat in the Wall Street uh, hedge fund. I first got involved as an investor uh, personally, and then I became part of the leadership team. I set up a hedge fund in India as well. So hedge funds, the origins of a hedge fund really go back to the time when you need to hedge risk. And that's, you know, the whole idea was if you took a position, if you took a long position in a particular stock because you expected the price to go up in time and to make a return, well, what if it didn't? So you needed to attempt to hedge the risk that you were taking by going long, by potentially going short. And that's how the notion of short position started to come in. Now, it started off in a very simple way as, a, as an idea to hedge risk, but hedge funds have grown to a very complex area of investing strategies. You've got long short, you've got equity, you've got, uh, you've got equity market neutral, uh, you've got macro-based ideas, you have event-based ideas, there are quantitative hedge funds. So hedge funds basically you know, are looking, uh, are, you, have, you have private equity, you have venture capital, you have mutual funds, and everything else is like a hedge fund. Because hedge funds essentially gives you tremendous flexibility across uh, different parameters of investing. And they can, they can invest across asset classes, uh, not just equities, they do derivatives, they can do structured products which combine equity and debt. Uh, however, hedge funds typically promise liquidity. So hence they tend to track listed securities, whether it's in commodities or in, uh, in gold or in uh, oil or in uh, equity or debt. Now, often uh, hedge funds have some secret sauce driven by the expertise that hedge fund managers of the team bring in. And I talked earlier about how, 
you know, expertise was one of the things that capital allocators were looking for. So clearly there's a lot of technology that hedge funds deploy. Uh, you know, huge analytics capabilities, big data capability, high frequency uh, trading is something that hedge funds will typically do. So the kind of technology that you need is significant, both from a hardware, connectivity, communications, and from a, a software point of view. Oftentimes hedge funds will have uh, technical teams uh, sitting um, within the fund and will invest a lot of money in technology to make sure they're able to deliver the kinds of uh, risk-adjusted returns that is expected from them. Uh, hedge funds also brought in this notion of systematic investing, which is uh, no human intervention. In a mutual fund, you would have heard of mutual fund managers or CIOs, chief invest investment officers, taking a call on which security to buy, when to buy it, how much to buy it at, when to sell it, how to uh, create a portfolio of different equities within a sector, systematic hedge funds, all these decisions are made in an automated way. Computers make that decision. The software has to be extremely sophisticated. If people are bringing in artificial intelligence and, and deep analytics now into, into play as well. So what's the intent? Fundamentally, capital allocators seek alpha from hedge funds. Alpha is the mantra in hedge funds. What is alpha? Alpha is the outperformance to the index. As simple as that. And in sophisticated markets, it becomes harder and harder to generate alpha. And hence, hedge funds have to keep innovating uh, through the course of their lifetime. So when you think about the high finance uh, structure, you know, you have mutual funds typically diversified, they're passive investors, uh, they're liquid, low risk to capital. You know, you don't typically lose your capital. You may not make the return that you, that the targeted returns that were offered. You may not, you may sometimes lose a little bit of money, but the risk to capital is very low. They don't hence offer outsized returns as well. So mutual funds are, have a good place to play. Alternatives can be profiled across the spectrum. So if you think about it from a return point of view, VCs tend to promise the highest returns, hedge funds lowest. Remember, hedge funds are only trying to beat the index. Um, from the standpoint of risk, VCs take on the highest risk. Hedge funds take on a very low risk um, in terms of uh, the capital that's allocated. Liquidity, VCs invest at a very early stage, so it could be a 10-year horizon. In fact, you're looking at 10, 12-year horizons for venture capitalists to get the kind of return that they want. Companies go from survival to growth. They could do an IPO and then, you know, at some point the VCs start to get the big returns. Hedge funds have very high liquidity because, like I said, they're mostly in the public markets. From an active involvement point of view, private equity is the highest. Hedge funds are the lowest. Because P, like I said, make a few high conviction bets, but the fund managers get far more deeply involved in the businesses they invest in. From a standpoint of correlation, VCs tend to be very high because they cluster in certain sectors. Many VCs will get into the same kind of company. If you take a look at how you know, people invested in Google or invested in Amazon in the early days, or many of the e-commerce companies in India, you'd see four or five VCs that have typically invested. So the correlation in terms of their own returns from a capital allocator's point of view is very high because they've all invested in the same sectors, and the same cluster of companies. Hedge funds correlation tends to be very low because they're across a spectrum of asset classes and markets and geographies as well. Um, from a standpoint of diversification, like I said, hedge funds tend to be high, venture capital tends to be really low. So impact is the next big wave across fund types. Impact as in, are you, are you, help, are you making a positive impact on the environment? Or are you impacting society in a positive way? Are you impacting governance? Are you impacting the economics of a sector in a particular way? So, you know, investors are trying to go beyond just pure risk-adjusted returns. They're trying to seek where they can impact. So what are the typical fund? If you look at the economics in fund industry, right, mutual funds are typically known for low cost. You don't pay a very high fee, management fee, or you don't pay very high cost. And the costs are also distributed across a large number of 
retail investors or institutional investors. Often it's in basis points. So, you know, rarely do you see exit penalties uh, from mutual funds. Now, alternative investment classes, whether it's VC, private equity and hedge funds, they have a unique structure. They typically will charge a 2 and 20. It's called a 2 and 20 structure. 2% management fee on the assets under management and a 20% performance fee. This is also known in the, in the industry technically as carried interest. Historically, carried interest has been taxed differently, more as dividend and not so much, and, and long-term capital gains and not so much as income. So, which is why fund managers in alternative investments have made a lot of post-tax wealth for themselves as well, and their investors, of course, because these carried return, uh, the carried uh, interest or the, or the performance fee is typically paid only after a particular hurdle rate is delivered to investors. And uh, globally, it's in the 8% to 10%. Only after a fund manager delivers 8 to 10% of a hurdle rate back to investors can the fund manager afford to take any of their performance fee. So that makes sure there's, a, there's symmetry in terms of returns. Now, you would have heard the phrase general partners, limited partners. General partners are partners in a fund who actually manage the fund and who earn from the fees. Limited partners are the investors in the fund. I talked to you about the capital allocators, pension funds, family offices, endowments. They are the typical LPs in funds. So in terms of uh, looking at how the big picture emanates in terms of asset management or alternatives, it's mind-boggling. You know, across the bond market or equity and debt and asset classes, asset management controls over 75 trillion US dollars of capital. Asset management has a huge influence on government policy, makes, breaks markets can make or break a currency. The sort of flows and, and uh, the returns that allocators expect oftentimes in different asset classes can make a very different impact, different, uh, uh, there's a very high level of significance to what happens to sectors. They can make or break firms as well. So, and you know, you've heard the story about how investors would come in and cut costs in a particular firm and then flip it. So, and sometimes those plans go bad and, you know, firms get destroyed. By the same token, when uh, significant investor investments come into a particular sector, the existing incumbent leaders are shaken up because the challengers can break through and disrupt entire markets. So think about asset management. It's a very complex beast. Not everybody understands it, but the way it impacts our daily lives is huge. And you often won't even see the difference it makes when you actually look at your day-to-day -day experiences. So it shapes the direction of the world, uh, in effect. So, you know, Shakespeare used to, you know, that there was a uh, mention of... Uh, in a, in a Shakespeare uh, play about uh, lucre, which is how they called money back then, being filthy, and uh, how uh, honorable men would not chase money or uh, lucre. Uh, so in the past, yeah, you know, capital uh, in terms of bonds and joint stock companies were funded by conquests, wars. In fact, bonds funded wars. It funded, it funded uh, the lifestyles of a few people, wealthy people, uh, it funded the vanity of a, few, of a few people. It funded arts, architecture. But this is getting more and more democratized over time. This concentration of money, wealth, and capital among a few people, thanks to the asset management industry, is democratizing the flow of uh, well-being from a financial point of view. So capital evolved and started to fund the factors of production after that. Factories and... Um, machinery, land and building, and those sorts of things. Today, finance is funding ideas. 
It's funding change. It's not just looking at factors of production, not just markets. It's going well beyond that. And that's the, that is where it gets to be really, really powerful. Impact is the new mantra, which I talked about earlier. Sustainable investing has become uh, something that everybody is paying attention to now. The United Nations uh, has come up with a framework for sustainable investing that's helping fund managers choose the right kind of companies to invest in based on those parameters as well. So it's becoming mainstream, more and more capital is getting allocated to impact or sustainable investing. So what used to be, you know, back in the day, capital was always required to acquire, to make investments. Capital is also now being used for expression. Allocators want to express themselves. So one thing I want to talk about is, you know, finance has been attracting the best and brightest students from STEM. And, uh, you know, no longer is finance seen as something which is bad. It's, it's really bringing out math, uh, quantitative, uh, uh, you know, people studying quantitative sciences. It's the big, bold uh, world. So capital has become, you know, very symbiotic and very reliant on innovation. You would have seen all of this is innovation. The fact that finance has evolved so much and is also revolutionizing the world it requires a lot of innovation in terms of what uh, finance is able to do. So if you think about innovation, innovation is happening in the brain, in the area of the brain in genetics, clean energy, clean tech, safety, convenience, there are all sorts of things that innovation is driving right now. You know, the whole mobile revolution and how we're looking at how uh, mobile phones have moved from convenience to necessity right now. So innovation influences capital flows. So capital influences innovation. Innovation also influences capital flows. In, in the way capital is structured and syndicated and structured and, and the way specialized funds, the kind of bets that capital makes. So capital and innovation have become kind of joined on the hip right now. You can't have practically one without the other. So if necessity is the mother of invention, capital is the father. And consumption is driving innovation, not production. <clears throat> innovation is more and more around life, lifestyle, more than just how to improve the factors of production. Today's innovation must attempt to solve tomorrow's problems. And hence capital sees the potential for tremendous risk-adjusted returns by looking at solving tomorrow's problems. The constructs of innovation, the way capital, you know, capital looks at idea to IP. It looks at how ideas flow and become incubators, labs, companies, scale, sell to strategics, go public, sell uh, to secondary uh, markets, uh, try and value intellectual property in a more serious way. Uh, the whole patenting cycle, which has gone a little out of control, protects and provides a moat in terms of how capital uh, can protect its own interest. And uh, there is the whole cycle now of angels and venture capitalists and private equity and hedge funds that are facilitating this process. It's all about scale, scale, scale. There is now clearly uh, you know, the method of trying to understand ideas is evolving. People are paying closer attention to how an idea can actually impact a sector, industry, geography, or a country, or the global economy. And it's getting to be more systematic. Uh, value propositions are becoming better understood. And there's always a, there is a, there's a desire to look for white spaces in a, in a very fragmented uh, set of industries there's a need to constantly look for white spaces where a firm can compete successfully and capital flows in heavily. Capital seeks ideas that have been qualified, that are not ready to go to market, that can address a white space and perhaps change an industry. It requires a tremendous amount of discipline to enter new markets and uh, there's a need to institutionalize and grow basis that and that's what capital seeks and capital will reward.
So overall, globally, we are moving from an era of scarcity to an era of abundance. And more and more capital is now flowing towards trying to solve basic problems, the water problem. As you know, there's a big discussion around, is the world going to run out of water? You know, people are concerned about clean air, they're concerned about food for everybody. Nobody wants to see people hungry anymore. So, you know, prevent big problems, diseases, uh, you know, social unrest is being, has got to be tackled because with, uh, with the growth of wealth, there is still a, a discrepancy in terms of, or a disparity of incomes and capital is also trying to figure out a way to solve that. All this is very contemporary. That's the point. You know, capital never thought about all of this. So the whole acceleration of idea to solutions and the whole process of feeding a virtual cycle of progress is what contemporary capital and contemporary finance is all about. Thank you.